What is up, Iwu crew? We've covered a few shocking incidents caught on CCTV, and it is clear that CCTV footage can capture some truly unexpected and shocking moments, sometimes even catching criminals red-handed. The four cases of CCTV footage we are taking a look at today were all used as evidence in the ensuing trials, but even knowing that their existence helped to convict some of the criminals we're discussing, it doesn't help to lessen just how chilling it is to witness a crime taking place with our own eyes. Let's get into it. On May 8, 2020, 16-year-old Louis Smith went missing in Havant, Hampshire, England. Two weeks prior to her disappearance, she had moved in with her uncle, 30-year-old Shane Mays, and his wife, Chaslyn Jane Mays, Luis's aunt. Described as a typical teenager, Luis had aspirations to become a veterinary nurse. On the afternoon of the 8th, her aunt, Chaslyn Jane, and Luis's boyfriend, Bradley Kircher, were reported to begin to panic when neither had heard from Luis, and there was no sign of her. They began looking for her, with Chaslyn Jane calling Luis's phone and Bradley going out to search for any trace of the girl. When there was still no clue as to where Luis could be, they soon called police to report that she was missing. An investigation launched to find the missing girl. Tracking her movements on the day of her disappearance, police released that they had narrowed down her exact disappearance to 12.49 p.m., as that is the last time a text had been sent from the teen's phone. Earlier that morning, she had also sent her final Snapchat to a friend. On May 21, 2020, after 13 days missing, Luis's body was discovered. It wasn't the result that anyone was hoping for, and her family was utterly devastated at the news. Her remains indicated that Luis's death had been brutal. Her skull was smashed in, so much so that the bones and structure of her face was shattered, including that her jawbone was detached from her skull. Her body had also been burnt in what investigators described as a cruel and brutal murder. Despite the damage done to her remains by the fire that had burnt it, there was evidence that Luis had been assaulted. Her exact cause of death may not ever be determined due to the burned and decomposed state of her body and the multiple injuries she sustained. During the investigation into Luis's death, police released footage caught by CCTV. On the day before she was killed, Luis and her uncle Shane Mays can be seen walking together near their neighborhood and entering a shop. They leave separately before meeting up again to walk towards their home. This is the last known footage of Luis alive. But this footage isn't the only thing captured by CCTV. Police posit that the video footage they collected from various CCTV cameras show Mays after they believe that he had lured Luis to her death. Police documents reveal that they suspect Mays allegedly promised her cannabis to get her to follow him into a secluded area in the nearby woodlands. The video takes place around 3.11 p.m. and reportedly shows Mays returning from where police believe that he killed Luis. The video clips show Mays in a red shirt walking along Swanmore Road. Mays was arrested shortly after the discovery of this footage. Disturbingly, when police had visited him at his home in the days following Luis's disappearance, he allegedly told officers he would lock Luis in the bedroom if she returned and asked if it was okay to restrain her. Police also released other CCTV footage that showed Mays buying pizza less than four hours after Luis had been killed. He is out calmly buying food while his wife was frantically looking for Luis. At Mays' trial, prosecutor James Newton Price QC said, quote, 
He's at home all those times his wife is phoning Luis to find out where she is, and obviously he didn't want to tell her. So what he did is go out and buy pizzas. He had with him four pizzas. He knew Luis was dead at this time. Luis was described as vulnerable, and the court was told by Newton Price that, quote, there is background evidence that Luis was unhappy in the care of Mays and his wife, and that she, an adolescent, was drinking heavily in their flat on the night before she disappeared. Before the incident, Luis had complained to her boyfriend that Mays would allegedly flirt with her. A video was presented to the court that Luis had filmed, which showed Mays tickling her feet. Initially, Mays denied murder but during his trial, he admitted to manslaughter. A clinical review was conducted and revealed that Mays had an extremely low IQ of 63. He was also assessed to have learning difficulties and a personality disorder. During the trial, Mays claimed that Luis had been the one to bring him to the woods, where they argued over her drug use. Reportedly, Mays admitted that he attacked Louise with a series of punches after he lost his temper during an argument. He first claimed that when he left the woods, Louise was still alive. But Newton Price alleged that he had attempted to assault Louise and then killed her in order to silence her telling anyone about the incident. Newton Price also summed up the manipulative nature of Mays's advances, saying, Luis was just 16. She was anxious, needy, fragile, and vulnerable. Vulnerable to the attentions of a predatory man who was apparently flirting with her and living in the same small flat. At the end of the trial, Mays was convicted of her murder by a jury and sentenced to a minimum of 25 years in prison. He reportedly showed no emotion as cheers of yes echoed through the building. The conclusion of this case likely brought Luis's family little comfort, as someone who the teenager had trusted had been the one to betray her. Her mother has spoken out about the pain Mesa's attack has caused her, saying, You came to my house the day you killed her, looked me in the eyes with no remorse when you knew what you had done was pure evil. Hopefully, Luis's loved ones can begin to heal knowing that her killer is behind bars. The next case we are exploring is no less chilling, and the CCTV footage is almost unbelievable. At 14, Philip Chisholm was a freshman in 2013. He had moved from Tennessee to suburban Boston, where he attended Danvers High School. Philip was described as a nice, respectful, and kind kid, but that would all change in the most shocking way. On October 22nd, surveillance footage released by police shows Philip's 24-year-old math teacher, Colleen Ritzer, in the hallway of the high school. Colleen was known as a popular teacher, who her family and friends said loved her job and described her as energetic and compassionate. She had stayed late on the 22nd in order to offer more help to her students. Philip can be seen stepping out of a classroom just as Colleen moves out of the video frame. It appears as if Philip second guesses the decision he has made, but once he pulls up his hood, Philip follows after Colleen. This seemingly innocent video is suddenly chilling as Philip follows Colleen into the bathroom. This CCTV footage is the last time Colleen was seen alive. In the next footage, Philip is seen by or inside the girl's bathroom, pulling on gloves. He then wheels a recycling bin out of the bathroom and down an adjacent hallway. There appears to be bloodstains on Philip's pants. A few hours after he had followed Colleen into the bathroom, Philip's mother reported that he was missing as he hadn't come home after school. Police were able to locate his phone when his cell phone company pinged it. 
The phone was found near the Hollywood Hits Theater, but without any sign of Philip. The court affidavit said that Philip was discovered by police the next day, wandering up and down a state highway. He was carrying a bag that contained a bloody box cutter, Colleen's driver's license and credit cards, and a pair of women's underwear. A police affidavit stated that when police asked him where the blood on the box cutter had come from, Philip allegedly replied, the girl. Colleen's body was soon discovered in a wooded area behind the school, where it had been covered in leaves. It was revealed in police documents that Colleen's throat had been cut. Police alleged that Philip attacked her, assaulted her, and used a box cutter to slit her throat. Following the purported attack, Philip changed his hoodie and pulled a mask over his forehead. After this, he is believed to have used the recycling bin to carry her body through the high school's hallway and out into the nearby woods to dispose of it. The police affidavit included the detail that a note was discovered next to Colleen's body that read, I hate you all. While in custody and awaiting his trial for Colleen's death, Philip was held at the Dorchester Department of Youth Services facility. There, Another incident allegedly occurred. Philip was accused of following a 29-year-old female worker at the department down a hallway and into a bathroom inside the staff locker room. According to court documents, Philip allegedly kicked off his sandals in order to walk silently and crouched to ensure he wasn't seen by other staff as he followed the staff member. The document also stated that it is believed that Philip brought a pencil with him into the locker room. Purportedly, Philip then attacked the female staff member, putting his hands around her throat and choking her so that she was unable to scream for help. He is also alleged to have punched her in the face, head, and jaw before other staffers were able to intervene. The victim was recorded in the court documents to have bruises on her face and a scratch on her back, which is believed to have been caused by the pencil. For this alleged incident, Philip was charged with attempted murder by strangulation, assault with intent to murder, kidnapping, and two counts of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. The results of this trial have yet to be released. Under Massachusetts law, Philip was tried as an adult for the death of Colleen Ritzer. At his trial, the prosecutors asked Essex County Superior Court Judge David Lowy to impose a sentence of 50 years. Philip was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after serving 40 years. He will not be able to apply for parole until he is 54. Still, when the result of the trial was read, Colleen's father remarked to the courtroom, I hate Colleen's killer and will never forgive him. He is evil, pure evil, and he must be punished. Our third case caught on CCTV is one that will likely leave you with chills. In 2020, police released this footage of 36-year-old Odessa Carey in Ashington, Northumberland, England. Odessa can be seen walking down the street carrying a white plastic bag in one hand and a blue bag slung over her shoulder. At the time, no one could have known that what the unassuming woman hid within her bag was horrifying and utterly appalling, straight out of a nightmare. It is reported that in the CCTV footage, Odessa had been on her way to visit a family friend, John Murray. This was the day before she was arrested. Murray later described to investigators that when she arrived, he saw that she had blood on her hands and arms. Murray also said that after cleaning herself off with baby wipes, she showed him what she was carrying in her blue bag, the decapitated head of her mother. Court documents reveal that she allegedly took the head of her 73-year-old mother with the same name of Odessa Carey out of her bag and kissed it on the forehead in front of Murray. Admittedly shocked, Murray did not own a phone 
and so he was unable to contact police. However, he went down to a nearby pub where he told someone about what he had seen. The police were called the next day. For days, Odessa had allegedly been carrying around her mother's decapitated head in her blue bag, as seen in the CCTV footage. Odessa was arrested at a house in Morpeth Close, where police discovered her mother's head where it had been hidden under a sink, still inside a bloodstained pillowcase. Court documents reveal that on the day of her mother's death, Odessa was believed to have smashed her mother's head with a mallet before she allegedly proceeded to decapitate her using knives and scissors. She then purportedly took the dismembered head into the bathroom, where she removed the brain. She is then alleged to have placed the head in her blue bag and left the home as if nothing sinister had occurred. The Newcastle Crown Court documents recorded that the senior Odessa Carey's headless body was discovered by police at her home, left on her bed in Ashington, Northumberland. During her ensuing trial for the death of her mother, court documents revealed that Odessa had been mentally unwell since she was six or seven. The court was told that her condition had worsened because she had reportedly not taken her medication consistently. She was described as being acutely psychotic at the time of the incident. Odessa's partner, Sharon O'Brien, has alleged that weeks before the incident, Odessa had killed her own cat and attempted to flush it down her toilet. Even with these potential signs, no one close to Odessa ever could have predicted what she would do next. Judge Paul Sloan told a jury that Odessa's diagnosis is likely schizophrenia and that she doesn't believe the body to be that of her mother. Odessa was deemed too unwell to plead to the charge of murder, but she was still allegedly found to have committed the acts of killing. Rather than a jail sentence, Odessa was sentenced to a hospital order where she will receive the help that she needs. In the year since the killing, Odessa's partner Sharon has revealed to news sources that Odessa, quote, still doesn't know her ma'am's dead. She still hasn't got a clue. As if to deepen the tragedy, Odessa has in fact asked her friends over the phone if anyone has seen her mother. The final case we have for you today is a chilling reminder to always look over your shoulder. On September 21st, 2019, 28-year-old Christina Ortiz Lozano, a cruise line worker, was on a date at a pub located on London Road, London, England. Little did she know she was being watched, or perhaps she had some idea that someone was following her as Christina asked her date to leave the pub and return to her house. When she and her date left the Giddy Bridge pub, Christina's ex-boyfriend, 31-year-old Abdelaziz El Yachui Erzat, was caught by CCTV following her and her date and hiding in the shadows. In the CCTV footage, he can be seen loitering on the street and waiting for Christina. He followed her to her home in Spear Road, Southampton. The court was later told that he stood outside of her house with flowers when Christina and her date arrived. Abdelaziz followed her inside the home where he grabbed a knife from the drawer in the kitchen and attacked her. An autopsy revealed that Christina had been stabbed 23 times in what Judge Jane Miller described in court as a savage, ferocious, and sustained attack with a knife. She had wounds to her chest, neck, and abdomen. It seems Christina had attempted to defend herself as Abdelaziz sustained injuries that required him to be treated in a hospital. Christina's date had waited outside, but went into the home when he heard screaming. What Vincente Bresso Biosca saw was described by prosecutor Carrie Malin in court. He saw Miss Ortiz Lozano already lying on her back on the kitchen floor, with Mr. Orzat crouching over her with a knife in one hand and his other on her throat. She had her eyes open, but he believed her already dead. She was not moving. 
He described Mr. Orzat turning towards him, shutting the door, and continuing his assault on Christina Ortiz Lozano. Christina and Abdelaziz had met while in school in Spain and had dated for about 12 years before they broke up. Court documents cited by the prosecution alleged that Christina had broken up with Abdelaziz because of his volatility and his drunkenness. Reportedly, he had also previously been arrested for causing criminal damage to Christina's home. It was following their breakup that he had allegedly ripped out light fixtures and radiators from the walls of the home. Because of his arrest for criminal damage, he was actually on bail at the time of the attack. In fact, his bail was only allowed on the condition that he didn't make contact with Christina. The New York Post reported that he had allegedly already breached his bail prior to the incident by sending Christina abusive emails. Abdelaziz's attack on Christina was described by Prosecutor Malin as a jealous ex-boyfriend in a fit of rage who conducted a frenzied attack on her, quite simply because she had gone out with a male, not Mr. Orzot. At the trial, Abdelaziz maintained that Christina had allegedly been the one to stab him first and denied the murder charge. However, he admitted guilt to manslaughter by diminished responsibility. Despite this, following a two-week trial, Abdelaziz El Yachui Orzat was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to serve a minimum of 19 years in prison. Tragically, Christina's father later stated that he had asked Abdelaziz to look after Christina, likely when they were still together because her family loved her so much. All four of the cases we explored today are chilling, and they serve as a reminder to look over your shoulder and to remember that you can't always trust the people around you. You never truly know what they might be capable of.